Okay, so as the title suggests, uh, this lecture is going to be on the effects of inflation. Let me just, <clears throat> excuse me, make two housekeeping announcements. So one is, um, most of the material I'm drawing from here is from my book called Understanding Money Mechanics, which is available. You know, it's a free PDF. I think it might be in the bookstore. I'm not sure, but you know, it's it's through the Mises Institute. So if you just Google my name, Understanding Money Mechanics, you can get more of the details on <clears throat> the stuff. I'm going to just kind of go over quickly here. The other big thing is, I think one of the big uh, controversies or issues when it comes to understanding inflation in recent times is the fact that after uh, the financial crisis in 2008, the Federal Reserve created a bunch more what's called base money, which you know fueled reserves in the banking system. And a lot of people, including myself, were concerned that you were going to see conventional measures of consumer prices rise. That didn't happen to the same degree that you know many of us were concerned would happen in the near future. Whereas after uh, when you know COVID, when the lockdowns occurred, the Federal Reserve once again created a bunch of base money, pumped money in the system. And there you did see more of the, you know, what the textbook pattern would have been, where, yep, the Fed creates a bunch of new money and you see prices rise rapidly. And so I'm not going to talk about that distinction of how come it seemed like it worked textbook fashion in the latter case, but in the former, it was at, at least more nuanced because I did a whole talk on that at a previous Mises University. So if you're interested in that, I'm not going to cover it here, but just go look at, I think it was, uh, what, 2022, I believe, is when I covered that. All right, so this is just more timeless uh, analysis, not talking about the particular recent episode with uh, the COVID inflation, except for the reference to Joe Biden. Okay, so here's what we're going to be doing uh, for today's lecture, just to give you an idea of what's coming. I'm going to first go over the two different ways that people use the term inflation. Then I'm going to talk about a, a famous uh, phrase that's attributed to Milton. Well, he actually said it. Milton Friedman's quoted as saying when it comes to inflation, and there's a sense in which it's right and a sense in which it's wrong. And then I'm going to focus Well, particular relevance to us here at Mises U is the connection between inflation and what's called credit expansion. And then finally, again, a very Misesian point here, I'm going to end by saying, like, let's try to avoid some of the common mistakes that even like right winger, you know, hard money types make when they comment on inflation, particularly this idea that they say, Money is like a measuring rod of value, and if, if there's a lot of inflation, then it's like the ruler expanding. And that's, I mean, there's a, a loose sense in which, yeah, that's okay if you're talking to a lay audience, but strictly speaking, that's not right. And so for, you know, a Mises U lecture, I, we'll, we'll get into that because I think it's important to understand. I, I think Austrians, particularly Ludwig von Mises, you know, they really have a sound grasp on monetary theory. I think that's what sets them apart as, you know, being... More, better economists than a lot of their colleagues in other schools. And so that's why I want to focus on that element as well. OK, so two different meanings for inflation. It's possible some other uh, speakers have already touched on this this week, but let me just go through this. So it's a bit of a long quote, but it's important. So this is from Mises. He was giving a speech in 1951. And I'll, I'll just read this. This is the only long quote that I'll have for this talk. And so he, he was given a speech in the United States. So he said, there's nowadays, again, this is 1951. There's nowadays a very reprehensible, even dangerous, semantic confusion that makes it extremely difficult for the non-expert to grasp the true state of affairs. Inflation, as this term was always used everywhere, and especially in this country, and again, he's in the U.S. when he's saying this, means increasing the quantity of money and banknotes in circulation and the quantity of bank deposits subject to check. But people today use the term inflation to refer to the phenomenon that is an inevitable consequence of inflation, that is, the tendency of all prices and wage rates to rise. The result of this deplorable confusion is that there is no term left to signify the cause of this rise in prices and wages. There is no longer any word available to signify the phenomenon that has been up to now called inflation. It follows that nobody cares about inflation in the traditional sense of the term. As you cannot talk about something that has no name, you cannot fight it. Those who pretend to fight inflation are in fact only fighting what is the inevitable consequence of inflation, rising prices. Their ventures are doomed to failure because they do not attack the root of the evil. Okay, so again, just to paraphrase, what he's saying is historically, and you can see this if you go, you know, this isn't like Mises is making stuff up. You can go read economics books that were like from, you know, like the late 1800s, early 1900s. And there, yeah, when they talk about inflation, they're talking about an expansion, like an inflation of the money supply. And, and by money supply there, it doesn't just mean 
the um, you know what we would nowadays call like the base money, but also bank credit. Okay, and so that and that's and we'll get to in the third part of this lecture. I'll get into that, and that has to do with Mises' theory of the business cycle, right? So he thinks it's related to inflation when it comes in via the banking sector. Okay, but the point being that originally the way economists used the term inflation meant inflating the money supply, and then it might contract. You know, back on the days when the money was tied to gold and or silver, what would often happen is there was some emergency like a war, and the political authorities would temporarily suspend the redemption of the currency in terms of the you know, the hard money to allow them to print more and to fund the war. And so that's for temporarily, you know, the, the money would lose its, its tie, its anchor to the base money, to, to the, you know, hard money. And so prices would rise rapidly, but then they would, after the war, they would eventually try to get back on the pre-war standard of, of the, the currency being tied to the gold or the silver. And so then you'd see prices go up and then they would come back down. And so that's why, like, if you look at a chart of the dollar's purchasing power over long stretches, like even like a 100-year stretch in the 1800s in the United States, it's fairly constant. It, it doesn't mean year to year it's literally flat, but again, the idea is like during a war, you'd see prices would go way up and then they would come back down gently over time as the authorities would you know, move back towards getting the dollar tied back to gold or silver, depending on the, the time period or what the exact rules were. Okay, and so you know, Mises' point is that's what inflation used to mean and then over the course of the 20th century, it somehow morphed into eventually what, what the public now means. And if you turn on the TV and they talk about inflation or you read in the paper that the Fed, you know, Fed officials are eyeing inflation rates and you know, their, their efforts to fight inflation, what people think they're talking about is because, oh, prices are rising. And even there, they mean consumer prices, right? Like if the stock market's going up, people don't complain about inflation, right? When they say, oh, things are too expensive now, they don't mean my 401k is, is, is rising too rapidly, it's alarming me. No, they mean when I go to the grocery store, you know, the price of eggs or milk is rising or, the, or, or gasoline's a good one. Okay, so that's, that's what they mean. And he doesn't so much get into it here, but elsewhere Mises says that this wasn't an innocent, just, hey, language evolves over time. But he thought it was more insidious that that was a conscious effort, at least on the part of some, to, you know, camouflage the fact that what's, what's causing the prices to rise, right? Because that's obviously... The issue that the, the creation of more money, including bank credit, is what allows, you know, it's what pushes up the prices, but the public is directly experiencing the prices rising. And so that's what they care about. And so then by shifting it away from the thing that's actually causing it to just the consequence or the symptom, then they can say, hey, it could be labor unions, it could be, you know, speculators, it could be, you know, all kinds of shadowy figures, it could be foreign, you know, oil exporters, that kind of thing, and, as opposed to the real culprit. And so in this context, then, it's particularly absurd when Fed officials come out for press conferences talking about our battle against inflation. You know, they, they say it's like the arsonist talking about how we're fighting fires or something. Okay. Um, but on that point, so what I tend to do, though, so some Austrians will do, especially like Austrians on Twitter, like, like just when they get in the fights with people, meaning like fans of the Austrian school, not necessarily professional economists, and, you know, somebody will be talking about inflation and they mean rising consumer prices. And then some Austrians will come in and just tell them, no, no, that's not what it means. It means this. I mean, certainly you, you can do that. But what I try to do is instead of just arguing about the definition and, and if, if most people now are using the term in that way, you know, to, to, rather than just to lecture them and say, no, you're using the word wrong. What I just do is to try to avoid confusion by saying monetary inflation versus price inflation. So I just put an adjective in front of it to try to be clear as to what I mean, and then you can go ahead and you know, ha have the argument that way. Okay, so next issue is Friedman's dictum right, and what I mean, maybe you've heard of this, is, actually, I'm curious, by show of hands, how many people have heard this, that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon? Okay, so a good number of you. Okay, so like I say, there's a sense in which this is, it depends what you think this means, it's sort of like Say's Law, that it's often characterized as just saying supply creates its own demand. And then depending on how you interpret that, it's either obviously false or it's got a subtle nuance meaning that's true and it helps you understand more. So same thing here. And this is, I put the dot, 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 because that's not all what he said, right? The actual quote's longer. And he says, I'm paraphrasing here. I don't have it completely memorized. It's not like a Bible verse to me. Um, but he says something like, in the sense that, um, 
that when the, when the growth in the money stock outstrips the increase in, in real output, then you know the result is rising prices or something like that, right? So what he's ultimately getting at is this so-called equation of exchange, MB equals PQ. And so I think, especially when you read it in context, Freeman is not saying that any time prices go up 8%, that means necessarily the quantity of money went up 8%. Because for one thing, that's clearly wrong, right? Because there's the increase in real output. Right? Just use it. For this thing, just in case people haven't seen this before, number one, Austrians typically don't like this. So I'm not showing you this to say this is an Austrian thing. I'm just showing you like to explain what Friedman's talking about here. Um, but this is the so-called equation of exchange that a lot of economists use especially if they're talking about the quantity theory of money, this is one way to try to express it. And so the idea is that these two things, they have to be equal. It's just a, it's an accounting tautology. So M is the stock of money. V is the so-called velocity of circulation. So it's like how fast a given dollar bill changes hands per unit of time, like for a year. And so M times V, if you think about it, that's like how much money is being spent, right? That it's like the, you know, how many dollar bills are there, or, you know, dollars, let's say, and then V is, on average, how often does a dollar change hands during a year? Well, then M times V is how, much, how many dollars were spent in total during the year. And then the right-hand side is P is the average level of prices, and Q is the total amount of real output. And so P times Q is the total amount spent on output. And so if you think about it and you define the terms correctly, those two things have to equal each other. Okay. Now, even there, again, to get into Austrians don't like this typically. So certainly Mises and Rothbard didn't like it. And again, in my book, Understanding Money Mechanics, I'll go through it in more detail if you want to see this unpacked. So part of the issue is they're just macro aggregates, right? Like no individual actor cares about this stuff. Nobody, would, like a business firm, when they're deciding, do we want to hire another worker or should we build another factory? Nobody says, hang on, what's the velocity of circulation right now in the economy? Like nobody talks like that. That doesn't influence anyone's direct action, right? So at best, this is not you know, codifying human action and, and understanding the economy that way. It's just like a, a, an accounting tautology that might be true at a system-wide level. And the individual components, like P, the average price level, that doesn't really mean anything if you think, you know, think it through. And Q is the total level amount of real output. Again, what does that you know, mean if you think it through? It's, so in a, in a vague enough sense, like you can say, hey, the US produces more total output than Bangladesh does, but when you start trying to get more concrete about it, it does get you know sort of meaningless, right? Because it's well, there's a certain amount of bushels of wheat and amount of you know computer software and blah blah. blah. You can start listing all the stuff, and there's just it's just lists of different physical and even intangible things. But there, it's hard to compare them to each other unless you use money prices. But then again, what we're trying to do is abstract it and come up with a real quantity. So you have to come up with some index, right? So I'm just saying it's. To even write this, you're already packing in a whole bunch of assumptions that typically Austrians are going to find quite dubious. So that's partly why the Austrians don't endorse this approach. But having said all those caveats on its own terms, my point is, well, I think Friedman, what he's trying to get across is when there's large scale episodes of inflation, particularly when there's hyperinflation, that's always a monetary phenomenon, right? So when you he read about historical examples, of some country where, oh yeah, the, the infl they'll say like the inflation rate was, you know, a thousand percent per month or something, or you know, prices were doubling every week, and you see these historical examples of the the restaurants couldn't have printed menus; they would have to just have chalkboards because prices they had to update so fast they it wouldn't be worth it to print out the menu because it would last, you know, wouldn't even last to the end of the meal. There, there's historical examples where people would try to pay for their meal at the start of the meal because it would be cheaper then than it would be by the time the meal is over. Like that's when you're in a, in a country where you're in the grips of a hyperinflation, that's how crazy stuff gets, right? So, um, so his point was when you're talking about things like that and even not as exaggerated, but just very large scale increases in prices, it's because the authorities are printing up boatloads of money. It's always why that is. And so you can kind of understand where he's coming from both in terms of why it's not literally always true, but why it's true in practice for large swings. So the reason it's not literally true is there's no necessarily quantitative relationship, right? So if the quantity of money doubles, like just instantly, 
it's not that every price necessarily doubles, even though you might think that, right? So if, if M goes up, you know, if M doubles, turns into 2M, all that this equation tells you is that, you know, V might go down or on the right side, something might happen too, right? So in theory, if M doubled, Q could double, right? And that's, you know, what like an extreme mmt -er who thinks there's all kinds of idle resources might say. Right, that, oh yeah, we just create more money that's gonna cause more demand, then you know, people are gonna get hired, the factories are gonna start humming, and, and real output expands. And so, right, so if you had a massive unemployed resources, you might think using the equation of exchange that doubling M doesn't cause prices to go up, it just means output doubles. And if that were to happen, this equation would still be satisfied, right? So this equation isn't really about economics, this is just about you know, accounting. You could be an Austrian, an MM tier, post-Keynesian, whatever, and this you could still try to use this equation to tell whatever story you wanted. Um, you could also say, you know, if M doubled, V could get cut in half. And that's partly what it did happen empirically after the 2008 crisis, right? That a bunch of new money came in, and it's not that consumer prices proportionally just mirrored what happened. And so if you look at charts of V, you know, it was coming along, and then when QE hit, it just dropped, right? So it's like, oh, there was a lot more money in the system, but people's flow of spending, even though it went up, it didn't go up nearly proportionally. And so in terms of these definitions, that would mean, oh, the velocity of turnover, you know, the number of times a given dollar bill changed hands went way down when all of a sudden there was an influx of more dollar bills, okay? So that's the way you could handle this. So the point being, if you're in a, in a situation, a historical episode where prices go up by a factor of a thousand in the course of a year, yes, yeah, theoretically, that might not be due to monetary inflation. It could be that the public's demand to hold that currency just fell off a cliff, right? And meaning that V went way up, right? So that's another way of seeing that you could imagine V could go up by a factor of a thousand and then P could go up by a factor of a thousand. That's how you keep things balanced. But in practice, it, you wouldn't, you know, that's not gonna happen. All of a sudden people are fine and then they just decide we don't want to hold this currency anymore, and we want our real cash balances to drop, you know, nine, by go down to one one thousandth of what it was yesterday. That just doesn't happen in practice. That people change their demand to hold the money for no external reason, even though theoretically, yes, the equation could could accommodate that. Uh, or likewise, you know, there you could imagine a situation like if there's an earthquake or something, and real output goes way down, right? So the flow of goods and services coming out of the, you know, out of the production process shrinks. Even if the money stock stayed the same, you could imagine, and if the demand to hold money didn't change, then yes, the unit price would have to go up, right? So if, if the flow of real output got cut in half, then the same amount of money now is chasing half as many goods, and so on average prices would double, if you wanna think of it like that. That could happen too. But again, even there, that would explain 100% price inflation rate, right? Prices all doubling. But when you get a, a situation where prices go up by a factor of 1,000, it's not that real output all of a sudden shrinks to one one thousandth of what it was before everybody would be dead, okay? So that's why in practice, this, so this is the example from, uh, yeah, this is from Zimbabwe. So I don't know if you can see this, but this scale over here is, uh, is logarithmic. Okay, so that each notch, it's increasing by a factor of 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can see that as it's getting in there, you know, 2007, 2008, and beyond, their prices just went through the roof. Okay, and you can see how it dovetailed with the quantity of money. And so when you explain a situation like that in Zimbabwe, where I'm sure you guys have seen it, you can go get it on eBay now, like a trillion dollar Zimbabwe note. That that's what happens. You you get into a vicious downward spiral where prices are rising. The, the you know the central government wants to keep being able to to afford real goods and services, so they got to keep printing even more and more money to stay a little bit ahead of the rising prices, so that they can still you know pay the troops or whatever it is that that they're trying the real resources they're trying to commandeer using the official money. And so once I get, again, once you get into that downward spiral, it quickly gets out of control where they're, they gotta keep printing. The, the, the percentage increase in the money has to keep rising more and more, right? So again, it's not just that that line is, is going vertical, but that scale is logarithmic, okay? So just to show how much more rapidly 
they kept adding more and more money as time progressed because they were, again, trying to stay ahead of the curve, and they just kept making it worse. And what's funny is, um, I actually probably should try to dig this up. There was the, the head of the Zimbabwe Central Bank was like in an economics conference after all this happened. And you can imagine, you know, he had a hard time with his resume trying to get a job somewhere. And, and he, so I don't, I don't know the context. Like, was he on a panel or did somebody just, I don't know the exact context, but I saw the quote. And he, and he was basically saying, I don't know why everybody's criticizing me and making fun of me. I was just applying Keynesian economics. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so yeah, anyway, and, and there was one sentence in which was like, yeah, poor guy, you know, he just, he did what he was supposed to do and look what happened. All right, so anyway, but that, you take that for what it's worth. But Friedman's empirical work, um, he really just documents and just shows like all these different historical episodes of when prices, you know, just you know, moderate, what we would just call moderate inflations versus like outright hyperinflation. And in every single case, it, it, like I say, it's, it's a similar thing where you can just see that the graphing the, the growth in the money stock against the prices it's, it's like hand in glove, okay? Now, again, don't misunderstand me. It's not that there's a mechanical relationship, and, and Mises stresses this a lot in his writing, and he said that it's typically what happens is in the beginning, the government prints more money than you see immediately reflected in the price rise, right? So that the government, if it increases the money stock 20%, it's not that prices go up 20%. They, they go up faster than they used to, but it's not a proportional thing. But then once the inflation really gets underway, then it flips, where if the government just doubles the stock of money, prices more than double. And so what's, what's, built, you know, what's happening there is the public's expectations start changing. And so once they start anticipating, so it, like, think of it this way, if you think prices are going to double next week, what are you going to do right now? You're going to try to get rid of all your cash. You're going to just buy anything because you're thinking, you know, if I'm holding $100 in cash on me, in general, prices double from this week to next week, what I can get for it is going to get cut in half. And so your incentive is to get rid of it now before the prices rise. But if you think through, if everybody's doing that, then that makes the prices, you know, it just kind of brings it forward. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? And so that's why Mises said once you get into this uh, pattern where the public starts anticipating the, oh yeah, we're in a period now where prices just keep rising, then even the government, even if it tries to slow the, you know, to take its foot off the gas, if you want to use that metaphor, it's, they, they, it's hard to get it back under control. And that phenomenon is why even in more moderate examples, you know, like in, in like a more uh, advanced economies, like the U.S. and, you know, European countries and so forth, they had a bad experience for them in the late 70s, early 80s. And then the lesson was, we don't want to let that happen again. We, they, they, you know, they use phrases like contain inflationary expectations or maintain the anchor. You know, they use all this jargon. But their point is that we have to convince the public that we're serious about inflation. And again, they mean consumer price inflation. Because again, once it, it's harder to fight the inflation once the genie gets out of the bottle. That's, that's the idea. OK, so let me spend a bit of time on this. So when inflation takes the specific form of credit expansion, it triggers the Austrian boom-bust cycle. Okay, so here, you know, you, you guys, in, in the course of Mises, you and you know, those early lectures, they, they walk you through the various topics and then, you know, the, the standard boom-bust cycle or Austrian theory of the business cycle is sometimes referred to is one of the topics. And so here, I just want to connect that with inflation and make sure you see the connection. Because this is something I didn't fully understand myself. So big picture is what causes the unsustainable boom in the standard Misesian story is credit expansion. It's, it's not, first and foremost, the central bank doing something, okay? And so, um, and, and this partly is, is a way that you can protect yourself and not get caught tying yourself up in knots because if you go around saying, oh yeah, what happens like in the US when there is that the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates and pumps in a bunch of money, and then there's a boom, and then the Fed raises rates, and then there's a crash, and then someone can say, oh, so how come there were uh, depressions and recessions before 1913? And then it looks like you know, you're contradicting yourself. Oh, well, and, and it's not even that, oh, you can do it when there was a, a, a bank of the United States, that, right? There's periods in US history where there wasn't a central bank, and yet there would be like a panic, 
Okay, and so that's totally consistent with Mises' theory. So I'm just warning you that the Austrian theory of the boom-bust cycle, strictly speaking, is not about the central bank causes business cycles. Given that there is a central bank, the, the, you know, the mechanism Mises talked about is exacerbated with the central bank. And so in modern times for countries with central banks, yes, the central bank policy is probably what's going to lead this and make it happen and make it worse than it otherwise would have been. But I'm just saying in terms of a theoretical, you know, fundamental explanation, what causes the boom-bust cycle in Mises' framework is that the banks engage in what he called credit expansion. And so what that is, it's, um, it has to do with what he called fiduciary media. And so uh, if you think, it's, it's easier to think of it when there's, when there's gold. So imagine that the community uses gold as the money and there's actual coins. And then people go and they put their coins on deposit in a checking account and the bank gives them notes, right? And the note says the owner of this note can go to any of branch of this particular bank and, and turn it in and then get one gold coin. All right, so if they kept 100% reserves, that wouldn't change the stock of money in the community. It would just change the form of the money instead of people walking around with a bunch of you know, jangling coins that might be you know, tip-off muggers, oh, I'm gonna follow this guy around because you know, I can hear there's a lot of change. Instead, you've just got notes, and especially, they don't have to be you know, one. It could be like a note for 10 or 20 gold coins. So that's much more economical, especially for large transactions, you know, just to be able to write a check that's basically saying, I instruct the bank to transfer this amount of gold out of my vault or you know, my account and you know, give it to this guy's account. Right? So it's just much more convenient. But as long as the bank notes or if you have a, you know, checkable deposits, as long as that is backed up 100% by actual gold you know, metals sitting in the vault, you know, that's not going to change anything fundamental in terms of the, the quantity of money. And so in general, prices quoted in ounces of gold, let's say, are not going to go up in that community. But now, if all of a sudden the banks switch to only having 50% reserves, what does that mean? So you know, on the eve of that policy change, there's a million gold ounces, let's say, in the community, and a lot, most of it is sitting in the vaults. And now the banks, they can make new loans to people. And, and so they, they issue more paper notes than there are gold coins backing it up because they know historically most people leave it sitting here on any given Tuesday. It's not that like everyone's going to show up and turn the paper in. So we're fine. We don't actually need to have 100% coins in the vault. If we just even had 50%, we're totally fine. So that's how we can get away with doing that. And so why would the banks do that? Well, because they can still earn interest, right? They, they earn the interest on the loan. So long as enough people pay back the loans that on net the banks make more than, you know, than the loans they have to write off because the, the person defaulted, they make more money. And so what's actually happening in terms of the accounting is more of the, the real gold coins now are the, become the property of the people who own the banks. That's actually what happens over time in that kind of a system. Okay, so anyway, but that's how it works. And it, but in terms of you know, Mises' theory here, so if you think about that, it's as if all of a sudden there's a million new uh, gold coins that come into the community. And what's essential though is for it to be a credit expansion is that it enters the community via the banking sector, via the loan market. Okay, and so yes, among other consequences of that credit expansion and that you know, inflation is that prices will eventually rise. It might not be a doubling, because again, in the Austrian tradition, you know, it's, the, things are more complicated than that. It's just not a mechanical process. It depends on the particulars. But certainly, if the banks go from 100% reserves to now 50% reserves, there's a sense in which you know, they lend out a thousand, or sorry, yeah, what I said, a, mil, or a million more notes. And so it's like the quantity of gold has doubled in a sense. And particularly if the merchants in that community accept the paper as being interchangeable with the gold coins, that's what would happen. So you would see prices get pushed up. The prices of things quoted in gold ounces would tend to rise. But besides just that general effect of prices rising, there would, it would also trigger the business cycle. And the specific reason is because when it's a credit expansion, interest rates get pushed artificially low. Right, so that's the way that the banks get the community to accept those new notes. Because originally there was an equilibrium, whatever the market rate of interest was, was clearing the demand for loanable funds with the supply. And now if the banks are basically coming to the market and wanting to lend another million notes into the market to borrowers, they need to reduce the price of borrowing. So that's what pushes down the interest rate so the banks can move those new loans into the market. Okay, so that's what... So that's the connection, right? So it's not merely 
artificially lo low interest rates. There also is inflation involved, but it's going through the commercial banking sector, okay? Just as an aside, just to really think through, you know, how Mises understood this, he's even got a neat little section in human action. So I, I walk through this, if you're interested in a more technical handling, my paper is called More Than Quibbles. It was in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. So if you go, you know, Google my name, More Than Quibbles, you'll find it. And Mises says, just as a theoretical possibility, in his framework, it's possible that even in a purely free market, you could have a boom-bust cycle, and it would be something like a community is using gold as the money, some guys are mining, they get a bunch of new gold, and they enter the, the town, and instead of just like going to the saloon and you know spending it on alcohol or whatever, what if they go to the banks and put it on deposit, and then the banks lend the new gold coins out? And so he's saying if the new money, even if it's genuine 100% gold, enters the economy mostly through this narrow channel, the idea is as the gold moves from pocket to pocket, it raises prices, right? It's called Cantillon effects. And so the idea is if one of the early sectors it hits is the loan market, then the, the prices that get distorted there first are actually, you know, interest rates, okay? So that's, that's one way of, it, it like technically pushes up bond prices, which pushes down yields, okay? So anyway, that's, so Mises says, in practice, this is a, a small thing, right? Because the, in any given year, the amount of new gold that's mined and brought to market is a small percentage of the existing stock of gold already, you know, being held for monetary purposes. But he got, he's just making a theoretical point. So th that's controversial, by the way, that, you know, I think Rothbard disagrees. Certainly Walter Block and William Barnett disagree with that. They say gold mining could not cause a boom bust cycle. So that's, you know, you can argue about that. But my point is just to make sure you need to isolate for Mises, what causes the business cycle is when there's an expansion in the money stock that primarily enters via the loan market because the prices that first get distorted are interest rates. And so that's what triggers. And so it's like giving the wrong signal so entrepreneurs expand you know, the structure of production in a way that's not consistent with underlying consumer preferences. right? So that's, that's the story. So here, again, I'm saying uh, with inflation, just you know, in general, monetary inflation, there's a difference between if the government just hands out money to everybody and they go and spend it, yes, that will cause prices to rise and that will cause some dislocation. But if the new money enters first through the banking sector, that specifically causes the business cycle as well as just you know, prices in general rising and making it hard for people to, to do economic calculation. Okay, the last topic here I wanna cover is um, Having gone through all this stuff, well, let me say one thing, <clears throat> just to elaborate a bit on that last point that I made there. So when we're asking, you know, what's the effect of inflation, from an Austrian perspective, I think one way to, to view it is to, to remind ourselves, you know, what, what purpose is money uh, serving for us? What's the point of having money? And it has to do with economic calculation and the Austrian tradition, right? That when you go through and walk through the origin of money and okay, and there's barter, and then there's the double coincidence of wants problem, and there's a mean of exchange, and then you go through all that stuff. And then ultimately, oh, that's what allows for economic calculation, right? And it ties into the socialist calculation problem, right? The, the critique of socialism, what is it? Mises is saying, again, the central planners, they have no way of knowing, putting aside their motivations. Let's assume that they're all good people. They want to help. People, let's assume they even have all the relevant technical information. They know, you know, how many uh, tires or how much rubber they would need in this and steel and windows and so forth in order to make a certain amount of cars. They, they know all the technical trade-offs, but still at the end of the day, they just would not know, should we make, use our resources to make this staggering combination of output goods and services for our people? or this other technically possible array of all these different possible you know, goods and services, and they would have no way of evaluating that. They just wouldn't know. And again, the, the reason is because they have no common denominator. Whereas, how is it that the market economy solves that problem in practice? Because the entrepreneur has reliance upon calculation, can turn to the accountant and just say, how much did we spend on our inputs? How much did we earn in our outputs? And that you know, gives you an idea of whether you were profitable. Now, even there, there's a lot of expectation involved. There's, there's a lot packed into that glib statement I just made about you know, making anticipations and so forth, but that's ultimately the mechanism. And so all of that relies on the ability to have a market for the means of production 
that all trades against the common good, namely what we call money. That's what makes all that possible. So to the extent then that there's debasement where especially the, the political authorities are coming in and injecting new amounts of money it, in ways that are unpredictable, especially, then that kind of uh, you know, dampens the ability of money to serve that role. Because now when you're making forecasts and appraisals trying to understand, okay, yeah, if we spent this amount on these inputs, we could combine them into you know, goods and services that we could sell to our customers down the road. If, if one of the variables now that you have to anticipate is how much can we sell these for down the road, not just because I have to anticipate the demand for my product in terms of will, will the people like my goods and services versus my competitors or you know, completely other thing, but just because we don't know what the money's purchasing power is going to be, and that's wildly fluctuating, well, then it makes it harder for that process to happen. And, and you know, Mises talks a lot about that, that during an unsustainable boom, there's a lot of what he called capital consumption. And part of what happens there is that you know, the entrepreneurs, like you, you spend $100,000 getting industrial grade ovens in a, in a big commercial bakery, right? You're just, you're making like a Panera or something. You know, they have these big, huge ovens that they use day in and day out. And those things depreciate over time, right? And so out of the revenue you're getting from selling you know, the pastries and whatever that this oven's making, you have to be setting aside amounts to be, you know, to, to build, a, have like a sinking fund, if you're familiar with that terminology, so that by the time you need to replace the oven, you've got the hundred grand built up that you've been, you know, squirreling away over time in order to buy the new oven. And then if you're not putting aside enough, then you're basically, you know, eating into the profits of the company. You're consuming the, the underlying financial capital of the business. And so during an inflationary boom, the entrepreneurs might not realize that that's what's going on, right? They see their sales going up. And they might think, oh, this is because I'm such a good entrepreneur. I really picked a good sector to get into. I was ahead of my competitors. I knew that the people really wanted you know, these bread bowls and whatnot here at Panera Bread. And so therefore, that's why we see revenue much higher than people thought a year ago. But if really, that's just because there's a lot, lot more money being printed in stimulus checks and whatnot, then you, know, you might not be, realize when I go to replace the oven in three years when this thing wears out, the price that I think I'm going to have to pay, you know, it's going to be much more expensive than I realize right now. So I'm not putting aside enough. And so economically, Mises says in a situation like that, what's happening is people are consuming the capital. Okay. So in a, um, you know, like colloquial sense, it's called eating the seed corn. So historically, like, what does that mean? Like if you're a farmer, you know, you need to take some of the, you know, the, the produce to, to plant for, you know, the next year's crop and you could technically eat that. Okay, and that allows you to have more consumption now, but then, of course, you're in trouble next year if you don't plant, you know, to, to replenish what happened. So more metaphorically, to eat the seed corn or consume capital just means, again, to keep the structure of production going. Out of the flow of output, you need to be redirecting some to at least replenish the capital stock that's being depleted physically, and you might not do that correctly in the midst of a, a you know, monetary inflation, okay? So having now walked through all that, a lot of hard money types, guys like um, Steve Forbes had a book where he did this, will sort of, in my view, like they, they swing too far the pendulum the other way and they say, oh, the absolute ideal thing to avoid that sort of mistake is what you want is the money to be this immutable measuring rod of value. Just like you know, a meter stick has to always be one meter long and that's its function. And if we allow the political authorities to change the definition of a meter or a kilogram or what have you in order to you know, make things more uh, convenient for us in the short term, that would just be debasing the whole you know, unit of measurement and that wouldn't do us any favors in the long run. And so likewise, you know, these guys say money is supposed to measure economic value and that's why you don't want the government debasing the monetary unit. You want it to be a fixed immutable standard. And, and therefore, you know, so, so that's, you, you understand where they're coming from and their, their heart is in the right place. They're, they're recoiling against the ravages of rampant inflation and how that, you know, makes money not serve as well as a, as a medium of exchange and a, a tool of economic calculation. But in a lot of places, Mises explains that that's, that it wouldn't be an ideal, that money only makes sense and only works in a changing economy if we were in a very static economy where it would make sense that money would just be stable 
then you wouldn't need money at all. Everything would just be repeating itself in the evenly rotating economy. And so that money is only a tool to aid action in a changing world. And in such a world, you can't even define, you know, what, what do you mean by, you know, a money of a perfect, stable, perfectly stable purchasing power? Because there, you know, you can come up with arbitrary indices. You can say, oh, it's like a basket of goods. But even there, okay, well, the basket of consumer goods that we're using to define CPI or the price level, or at least the consumer price level in 1950, that's not going to be the same as today, right? They didn't have smartphones in the basket there back then. You see what I'm saying? Or, or computers, they didn't like, how much did a bunch of a, a, a gigabyte of RAM cost in 1950? Like that doesn't even make sense. Okay. So you can see how the basket of consumer goods would change over time and that you couldn't really define that in that sense. Okay. Um, also, too, just you know, just thinking it through, that the, the the problem with likening money to a measuring rod, right? So if if you talk about a, a ruler and say, okay, uh, a ruler is 12 inches long, one foot, and it should it should be one foot, and it just measures length. Well, length is an objective fact of the external world. Like to say something is three feet long, what that means is it does have this specific length. And that we're going to compare the length of the of the measuring rod. Let's say it's a, a, a one foot ruler, and we say, oh, we you know did it here, marked that, and then we moved it over, marked it, and moved it over. I could put three of these rulers has the same length as this object, and that's what I mean when I say this object is three feet long. And yet, doing that demonstration and or you know using that convention only works if the the unit of measurement is the same when I go and measure something else. If something else is six feet long, and I would say, oh, that's twice as long as that first thing. Yep, that only makes sense if the measuring rod is the same between those two experiments, if you want to use that language. But when you say, oh, right here, this person spent $3 on this item, and then over here, somebody spent $6 on that item, does that mean that thing had twice as much economic value as this thing? And you realize, no, because, I mean, there's lots of problems with it. But for one thing, you know, e economic value is not a quantitative thing, if we mean subjectively. And also, in a trade, w when you spend $3 on some item, you're not saying this item is worth $3 to me. Wh what's actually happening is you're saying this item's worth more than $3 to me, and the seller is saying the $3 is worth more to me than this item. And that's why you guys exchange it is because of, you know, it's a win-win it's a transaction. So you see how that's just fundamentally different from taking a, you know, a ruler and saying this thing is three feet long. That there's no equality of valuation going on there when you say, you know, when you, when you use market prices, you're technically not saying these things equal that amount of money, right? And that's kind of the, the problem that Aristotle got into, right? And, and that's one of the, the whole things that happened in the subjective marginalist revolution when they overturned that way of thinking is that you know going back at least to Aristotle, there was this idea that in market exchanges there was some substance, something of a quality in the things that were superficially different, and that's what we were trying to say was equal, and and you know the, therefore, and then Marx came up with what he was trying to you know congeal labor power or socially useful labor, all these different things, and it was the marginal subjectivist revolution that said no, that's just totally wrong. There's an inequality of valuations. That's what explains a voluntary trade. Last point here I'll make in the minute I have left is so you know that's the, the fundamental building block. And so I, I think you can see now you know the, the point I'm trying to make here. So be careful. Don't rail against monetary inflation and currency debasement so much that you then end up thinking a perfect money would have a constant purchasing power and would you know be measuring value as an immutable rod. That does that doesn't make sense. But there is something. Mis not mysterious, but subtle going on, right? That you're starting with subjective, qualitative appraise, um, exhibitions or demonstrations of subjective preference, which are ordinal in their nature. Just, you know, you're ranking things. There's no equality going on. If, if you give up something to get something else, you can say, I value this thing more than that, but you can't say, I value this 13% more than that. All you know from a given transaction it's an ordinal relationship. One is more than the other. But yet, once you use money and have money prices, there is a sense in which you know, we're reducing things to a common denominator, right? And Mises talks about that. So it's a very subtle thing 
involved there were going, and, and Mises talks a lot in Human Action about this, that he says this is like one of the underpinnings of Western civilization, that what monetary calculation allows us to do is apply arithmetic to you know, economic activity, to things that in and of themselves would just be subjective and ordinal. There's a sense in which we can apply arithmetic to that category of action, and that's the benefit of economic calculation. So it's a very subtle issue, and, and I think, again, most economists don't even realize like, how much philosophically is going on here, and that's why I think the Austrian school continues to be important. Okay, thanks, everybody.